Hi, and welcome to the Great Talks With podcast. I'm Dani, and today I'm going to talk with Caitlin Hughes. He is the executive director of the SCI, the Solar Cookers International. If you haven't heard about it, that's okay. But the SCI is an international nonprofit NGO working since 1987 to improve human and environmental health through solar thermal cooking technology. They are focused on advocating for solar cooking to the world, building capacities for communities and research. And also, if you're new to this podcast, please press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app because today we're going to learn about how we can empower people's lives while preserving the environment. Hi, Caitlin. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm excited to talk about it. <laughs> Do you- well, let's begin with Solar Cooker 101, right? Because to be honest with you, uh, whenever I think about housing in the sun, I usually think first on solar energy in terms of solar, solar panels to power my house, and stuff like that. So my mind doesn't go straight to cooking. Can you please just make a quick introduction to us to solar cooking? Of course. So there are actually hundreds of different types of solar cookers. So everything from a very simple and basic cardboard and tin foil, which you could probably make with the things you have around your home right now, to institutional scale rooftop systems that generate steam and can cook for thousands of people at a time. And then there's everything in between. Um, So we promote the technology in general and encourage people to use it. This vast array of types of solar cookers all use the same basic types of principles of directing sunlight and converting it to heat and then absorbing that heat. So you'll see some, some similar characteristics across different types, like something reflective to direct that light. Um, You'll see something that traps that heat. So kind of like the greenhouse effect, but using it to our advantage to cook food instead of talking about global warming. Um, And then you'll often see things like using a black pot because black absorbs heat. Um, So solar cooking can be used to cook food, to pasteurize water. Um, You can dry foods as well. So many different applications. Wow, that's truly wonderful. I didn't had an idea about these whole things. And I've got to say that in my first thoughts on, oh, okay, I'm going to create like a solar oven or solar stove, I usually don't expect it to be as hot or be as efficient, but that's, that's no thing, right? There's no such thing. There's no problem. Right. Yeah, uh, exactly. And and as I said, there's many different types. Um, so, for example, a reflective panel cooker is going to work very similar to, for example, a crock pot or a slow cooker, similar cooking times and temperatures. Um, a box oven is going to work very similar to an oven in terms of the things that you would cook, how long it would take, the temperatures that you reach. Uh, something like a parabolic, so it looks kind of like a satellite dish, is going to work similar to what many people are familiar with cooking on a stovetop. So if you're doing like stir fries or something that you want, uh, we did popcorn the other day. Um, and then there's, oh. yeah, <laughs> um, so lots of fun. Um, and then there's evacuated tubes. And like I said, uh, institutional scale solar cooking. So there's a whole range and it just, you know, the, the sector as a whole is continuing to grow and develop as well, which is really exciting. Mm, well, really, that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, considering that, what exactly is the work that SCI has been doing for the past 30 years? Yeah, and thanks so much for touching on that earlier. So we are working to address a challenge that affects about 40% of the world's population. So 3 billion people, approximately, with a B, uh, are cooking over open fires. And that is really challenging for people's health and the environment. Um, Predominantly affects women and children, unfortunately, because they're the ones who do the cooking or have to gather the fuel. um, Because a lot of the families that we're talking about can't just push a button or turn a dial. Um, That would involve, you know, walking miles and chopping down trees. Or, for example, we're working right now in Kakuma refugee camp. And so the refugee refugees aren't provided with enough fuel to be able to cook their food. So then they're faced with a difficult choice of do I trade some of my limited food rations to be able to have fuel to cook the remaining food. Um, But solar cooking is a great alternative to that because sun is plentiful. It arrives at our doorsteps almost every day. Um, And once you have a solar cooker, there's no ongoing cost for fuel. So um, it's really a beautiful solution. And uh, even the simplest solar cooker can save a family from burning one ton of wood in a year. So think about on the scale of 3 billion people, uh, it's got a significant um, potential there. Yes, absolutely. And it, it's 
really impressive how we can tackle many links in the chain. It's not just the chain of poverty, but also the, the chain of sustainability and how we can uh, keep our uh, resources renewable, right? So that's that's awesome. That's really amazing. And you've just won the Killing Curve Prize, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Congratulations on that. Can you tell us some more about, uh, about it? Because I don't know if many people know about this award. Sure, yeah, and thank you for the, the recognition and the congratulations. We're very excited. Uh, so the Keeling Curve Prize recognizes the most impactful climate projects around the world. So there was about 400 applicants this past year, and the Global Warming Mitigation Project selected the top 10 winners, which Solar Cookers International is very honored to be one of the laureates, and they have a very uh intense process process in terms of analysts and judges that go through all these applications um but we're very excited to be able to work with them and to be able to focus on solutions because i think so often it's really easy to get overwhelmed by the challenges that we're all facing around the world but in having solutions to focus on um it's it's really neat to see everything that's being done and to be recognized in that way Ah, yeah, absolutely. And again, congratulations. It's amazing. And I was really, really uh, amazed by uh, how well structured SCI is. And I think this award is just like really a consequence of all this work we've been doing. It's really amazing. When you create those plans, because uh, reading the website, I, yeah, as I said, you had these three points of action. You talk about it. You help communities to build their own capacities and you also work on research and have this huge net of inform information, which it's incredible. And whenever you're helping people to think about installing these solar cookers, what factors are taken into consideration when planning to implement that? Because I feel that I know that you have like a world spread presence, right? <laughs> I think you've mapped over 3 million solar cookers in the world, right? That's Four. amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so how, uh, what are the, the factors are taken into consideration for that? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that. Um, and we have actually adapted a tool. So there's a exploratory needs survey. So this is one of the ways that we help support the capacity of the entire solar cooking sector. So if Somebody like yourself or anybody listening to this podcast is interested in learning more. That's one of the resources available on our website. And so there's a lot of different factors that we look at. Of course, you know, climate is one. Um, and interestingly enough, it doesn't have to be hot in order to solar cook. You just need the sun. So if you can see your shadow, it's a good day for solar cooking. Uh, one of my colleagues actually lives in New York. And so we've got photos of him solar cooking with snow on the ground, but it's a beautiful sunny day and he's solar cooking. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but, you know, uh, thinking about making sure that there's that sun is, is important. Um, having somebody within the community who is eager to take this on, because we found that in order to be sustainable and scalable in reaching this demand of about 3 billion people, having community leaders who are excited about this technology and can be that leader and also help show others cook their local foods, speak their local language, and continue to be that presence, because I wish we could be everywhere all the time, but unfortunately we can't. Um, so having somebody to be that early adapter and encouraging within their families and within their communities is really important. Um, one of the other things that we make sure as well is when people are looking at solar cooking, uh, we definitely encourage local production because again, it's more sustainable and more scalable. Um, shipping solar cookers all over the world is not necessarily that. Um, so when it can be made within the community, there's a strong sense of ownership. So for example, the solar cookers that are being used in Kikuma a refugee camp are being made in Kenya by Kenyans. And there's so much pride and so much ownership around that. It's really exciting to see. And then there's that knowledge in terms of how to make them, how to expand, how to repair them, uh, which I think is really important in this movement. Um, we also encourage people when looking at solar cooking to make sure they pick a solar cooker that can work for the types of foods that they want. So, mm -hmm. you know, for example, if you cook mostly like curries or soups or stews, a reflective panel cooker is going to work great. If something like, you know, being able to make a stir fry is really important to you, then you might want to look at something like a parabolic because being able to cook the foods that you normally eat is going to be a good factor for success. So it, it takes a lot of cultural aspect, aspect as well, right? It's not mm -hmm. just uh, physics or materials. It's really about how people live with cooking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And, and considering that, what are the, the challenges you face in getting people to change the way they cook? Because there's always a shift, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so I think the first thing that we're working on, and we're actually addressing that right now, is through awareness. So this fits in also in terms of the advocacy goals that Solar Cookers International has. So for example, we have consultative status at the United Nations, and we'll go to things like the United Nations Climate Conference or the High Level Political Forum or the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. And there we have a chance to meet civil society and government leaders. Uh, for example, I remember a conversation with the Ener Energy Minister minister from Uganda. And he was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is exactly what my people need. Thank you so much for sharing this knowledge with me. Like, I can't wait to go back and, and share this information. And, you know, we were able to connect him with people who were in the area working on this, one of our global advisors. Um, so really about building those network connections to be able to expand. Um, so that's that's one of the challenges. Um, one of the things that we try to do in terms of the training is to explain the benefits, as you touched on earlier, in terms of many different aspects. So there's environmental benefits. We're not, you know, cutting down trees for fuel if you can just use solar energy. Um, we're not creating greenhouse gases by burning wood or burning charcoal or burning animal dung. Um, there's also women's empowerment benefits. So, you know, oftentimes women, if they have to go collect fuel, they're at risk for sexual violence um, because there's conflict over natural resources between different populations. But sun, there's enough for everybody so that <laughs> we don't have to fight <laughs> over that. Um, there's also really strong economic benefits, which is important to talk about as well. So some of the families that we would work with otherwise could spend up to 40% of their household income on fuel. And if they can save that because solar energy has no cost, then they can put that towards school fees or medical expenses or, you know, business generation, whatever it might be. And even solar cookers can be used in that business generation as well, because then you're not also having that cost of investing in fuel. Um, for example, there's a woman in Nepal who we've worked with, and she actually started a solar cooking restaurant. And she was able to save significant money that she wasn't spending on fuel because she had a solar cooker, which then she could use to buy more food for her family, which is really important. Um, and then and if you look at the economic benefits in terms of, you know, not just the individual and household level, but also the country and the global scale, because if you think about the cost, the economic costs of climate change, but also the health costs of cooking over open fires, because people are going to get sick more often, there's going to be a lot more premature deaths. And then there's also generational consequences, too, because if you think of maybe a pregnant mother cooking over an open fire, breathing in smoke with pollutants equivalent to smoking 400 cigarettes an hour, that's not going to be great for her baby. So if we can avoid that, then, you know, there's savings on the individual household level, but also the country level, because they're not having these healthcare costs, um, and also the global scale. So um, communicating about these benefits on many levels, I think, is really helpful in terms of scaling and growing the movement. But I had no idea of the whole scale of things like this, because I truly thought about small communities and maybe individual actions. I really couldn't see this whole chain of, of things happening and being affected by it. That's, that's incredible. And that made me think that uh, I'm in Brazil right now and we are facing like this big economic crisis as an effect of the COVID crisis. And one of the things that went, the price went sky high was cooking gas. So many, many families, low income families especially are suffering with that. And interestingly enough, most of the low income families are really supported by women, like not just on domestic chores, but also financially. So that is also a, a tool to empower women, right? As you just mentioned. So that's really wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, yes. exactly. And <laughs> you've got a, you've got a very real world experience of what you're, you're living. Yeah. I mean, and it, it really does give energy independence. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost like a democratic energy because it's available to everybody. You know, you don't have to worry about political tensions or blockades or shortages. Mm -hmm. it's, it's there. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and uh, I mean, if I wanted to have solar cookers for my community here, how could SCI help me? 
Yeah, thank you so much for asking. So a lot of different ways. Um, so we are the informational hub and resource for the solar cooking sector. As I said, we encourage local production. Um, so we actually have two websites. One is solarcookers.org, and that's kind of focused on what SCI is doing. But one of the things we do is we manage the world's largest online database of solar cooking information, which is solar cooking, I-N-G, Dot org. And so that is about 1800 pages of information and it is freely available online. We encourage you to go. It automatically translates into about 45 different languages. Um, and there's so much information you can search by country. So you can look at Brazil and see what's going on in terms of solar cooking in Brazil or Zimbabwe or anywhere in the world. Um, and then we encourage you to connect with somebody who's in your community and might already be solar cooking because they might have some great tips that's specific to the foods that you like to eat. Um, we do also have, there's plans in terms of if you wanted to make a solar cooker and open source designs. Um, so that's one of the things Solar Cookers International did is we created the Cook It, which is a simple kind of solar cooker, can be made easily and affordably anywhere around the world. We did that by request of the United Nations uh, Refugee Agency. So there's open source plans there, but also many others. Um, or you can look, if you're interested in buying one, we have a list of manufacturers by country as well. Uh, we do encourage people to, uh, and this fits in with our research that you were talking about, uh, if you're interested in learning more about solar cookers, we have a performance evaluation process, or PEP testing, where we actually measure how powerful different solar cooker models are. So when we were talking about finding a good fit in terms of what you're looking for and what your needs are, obviously there's many factors to consider, but finding a good fit in terms of that, uh, that's some information that we provide um, to help enhance everybody's knowledge. So looking for ones that are PEP tested will give you more information. Well, that's very useful. And you also do some research on adoption and adaptability of the, uh, the cookers, right? Mm -hmm, how, does, exactly. how does that happen? How often, to, how often do you do that? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we actually developed the adaption and impact survey. So we gathered a team of about a dozen solar cooking expert, experts from around the world and came up with a standardized survey. Um, because when I first started working at Solar Cookers International, there was different project evals and everybody was asking different, different questions in different ways. And one of the things Solar Cookers International tried to do is to get a global picture of solar cooking. So before I started working, nobody really knew how many solar cookers there were in the world. So we've worked to gather that global data so that then we can share it with government leaders. And when they're like, oh, this is an interesting idea, we can say, actually, it's not just an idea. Here's all the places in the world. Uh, I remember meeting a minister from Papua New Guinea. He's like, I want to be on this map. How do we get on this map? We want solar cookers, which was really great to see that inspire that, that conversation and that interest. Um, so gathering that global data and then also encouraging everybody who's working in terms of solar cooking to get baseline data before solar cooking and then after so we can look at things like fuel savings and have the data that I was sharing um, in these really important conversations. Great. Uh, and well, we are just coming to the close to our interview. So I have two more questions for you before we go. Sure. <laughs> uh, one is, so you just mentioned that uh, we know, you know, the impact that solar cookers have in the world, but also what is the impact that SCI specifically has today? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, we work in so many different ways. And like I said, a lot of what we do is trying to lift up the sector. Um, so for example, we were able to just do an event at the high level political forum with the United Nations. Um, so this is an opportunity where country leaders from all around the world get together and they talk about the sustainable development goals. So as you were saying, solar cooking touches on so many different things in terms of environment, health, poverty. Um, and so the sustainable development goals actually are are globally agreed upon goals that you know our world is trying to work towards to basically improve everybody's lives and the future and solar cooking positively impacts all 17 sustainable development goals so we were able to go virtually to the high level political forum this past year and we were able to bring voices of our global advisors so we were able to share case studies and real solar cooking examples from kenya from Nepal, from India. One of our global advisors is using solar cookers to actually sterilize medical equipment. 
which is a really important topic of conversation these days. And then we're encouraging country leaders to include solar cooking in their government policies because then that continues to open up even more doors and more opportunities for collaboration, resources, and support, especially with big organizations like the United Nations. So recently, Kenya actually just included and mentioned solar cooking in their voluntary national review or their policies talking about how they're working to achieve the sustainable development goals. So that's just one of many examples, but I think we play that really important role of elevating leading solar cooking voices around the world and making sure that their voices are heard at really important events like the United Nations. Yeah, this is a, a, such a necessary work because very often we like to talk about things and how we can change things and we need to raise the voices to get the policies to change, right? So having an institution to back us all up, it's extremely important. So uh, to sum it up, and at last, but very, very, very importantly, how can people can be part of the SCI efforts? Thanks so much for asking. There's a lot of different ways, which is great. Um, solarcookers.org is a great place to go to sign up for information. Um, you can join the Solar Cookers International Association, which is kind of like a membership. Um, of course, you can make or buy your own solar cooker and start solar cooking. I encourage it. Um, all of us on the team solar cook frequently and have cooked all kinds of different things. Um, you can support our work. Uh, there's so much more that we need and want to do, and it really takes everybody working together. It's a, it's a global solution, and it's something we all need to be working to address um, very urgently. Um, yeah, and share exactly like what you all are doing. Share the word. So um, if you find this podcast interesting, of course, please share it with somebody else who you think might be interested as well. Um, and yeah, check out our website, solarcookers.org. Amazing. You see, there's no reason why people would not join the cause. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's it for today. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Again, this has been a great talk. I love to learn more about it. Thank you so much and, for this opportunity. <laughs> uh, our pleasure. <laughs> and thank you for listening as well. And if you enjoyed this episode, please press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app, because that will show the algorithms that this is an important conversation and more people can learn about the importance of the Solar Cooking International. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye and see you in the next episode.